Sunday, September the 20th. This is lesson three out of unit one. It is titled, Speaking Up for God. Our devotional reading is Revelations, the 22nd chapter, verses one through seven. Our background scripture is Acts 5, verses 12 through 42. And our key verse is Acts 5, verse 29. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Our printed text is Acts, the fifth chapter, verses 27 through 29, and also verses 33 through 42. This unit is also entitled uh, Seeds of New Growth. And our lesson's aims for this particular uh, lesson is describe the apostles' resolve to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah and contrast the motives of the apostles with those of their opponents and then share the gospel boldly with one believer or one unbeliever in this week ahead. The background of our lesson is from the works, the mission work of the apostles uh, centered around the day of Pentecost when the Lord as he had instructed them to go into the upper room uh, and there they would receive power, the Holy Spirit and then that was actually uh, magnified uh, through Peter as he spoke unto the people and the apostles, uh, and they began to communicate with people in unknown tongues. Uh, this was a sign that the Spirit of God was operating in their midst. And then also the healing of the beggar uh, who... Peter and John had healed, uh, and he began to leap in uh, to the temple at the gate that was referred to as beautiful. And so uh, the word begins to travel as to the works of these apostles. And uh, it was evident that their message, their teaching, uh, their works were different than those who had been appointed as the religious rulers over the people at that time, that the beginning of the early church. And this group that had risen to the position of being overlords over the people at the beginning of the early church, the nation of Israel. This group was referred to as the Sanhedrin, a group of 70. And these uh, officials, shall we say, had joined in with the Roman military, the Roman government. And as the church in its beginning, and now Rome had conquered Greece, and now there's the expansion of Rome, and we have a new order, and now, this group has linked with the new government and have positioned themselves as the authorities upon religious teachings, upon the actual law of the scripture, the Torah, and then also they had... Um, position themselves in a place where they basically were sought by re, 
uh, Roman officials and authorities, whenever there was some uprising or whenever there was a anticipated disruption or disturbance among the people, then these overlords referred to as the Sanhedrin would be called into council to um, address the situation at hand uh, to inform the authorities whether or not this is a real threat uh, is this something that will just dissolve itself easily uh, is this something that we should pay any attention to um, what what say you about this situation needless to say this group of rulers uh, were not friends of the apostles. Uh, they were not uh, akin to trying to not be oppositions or deterrents to the work or, or the mission of the apostles. So let's look at the first three verses here where it says, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest, which was Annas, asked them, saying, Did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, teaching, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now, so that we really have an understanding here of what the high priest, Annas, and the council was addressing to Peter and the apostles is if we look at the background of this, especially where uh, it is mentioned that and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, we must first remember that it was the Sanhedrin that held a trial in the dark of the night to condemn Christ to be guilty of and, and rewarding of death. And we can find that in Matthew, the 26th chapter in the 66th verse. It was also the Sanhedrin that after this trumped up trial, they also approached Pilate the next morning. And then they persuaded the people to accept a murderer, Barabbas, but to have Jesus to be crucified. So when we look at the order of what is taking place here, this group, the Sanhedrin, they did not want their names to be associated with the back hand or the back room closed policy of how they manipulated the whole structure of having Christ presented as the one to be crucified. Now we fully understand and know that that was the purpose that Christ came. But we also need to look at how the works of man, the works of systems, the work of closed organizations and their manipulation into trying to defeat the purpose of God. Now they are not able to do so, but their works are engaged for that main goal and that main purpose as to let's remove this teaching. Let's remove this individual. Let's crucify him, lest he make our position less influential at the level that we now hold. 
And so when we look at why there is such great concern, we first put this in the proper perspective that this is a new government. These people are trying to position themselves to be a part of this new established order. They want to be in control. They want to have prestige. Uh, they want to be the ones who are sought uh, and uh, the ones who provide the advice on how things should be handled. So they are concerned that through this teaching and bringing to the people's minds the remembrance of Christ, then also people will begin to wonder, well, why is he not with us now? What happened? Well, there were some trials that came about, and this group over here, they kind of manipulated the system, and they worked behind closed doors, and the next thing we know, they had offered our Lord and our Savior up to be executed, but they let a murderer go free in his place. And they did not want the group that they had placed themselves to be lords over, they did not want these masses of people to recognize that you guys are the ones who manipulated the execution of our Lord and Savior. And this is their intent when they said, we don't want the blood of Christ to be on our hands. We don't want to be able to recognize that we are the cause of why this action took place. Remember now, the chief priest had informed the rest of the council that we've had these apostles uh, in before the council before, and we have already warned them and told them that uh, don't go out and continue this preaching about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so we've already given them forewarning uh, to which verse 33 out of the text says when they heard this, uh, they were to cut, they were cut to the heart. So they were very disturbed by what they heard. You mean to tell me we already gave these people a warning? We already told them to back off. We already told them not to open their mouth up. And you mean to tell me they went against what we instructed them to do? Who, who do they think they are? So the scripture says, and they took counsel to slay them. They wanted to kill them right away. Uh, now they were not, uh, now these are uh, religious leaders. These are the ones who know the law. Uh, these are the ones who are actually uh, teaching the people to try to keep peace and to try to keep order among the masses. Yet themselves, yet themselves, they are ready to go out and kill anyone who may be in opposition to their position. So uh, they had done this before, and the scripture tells us of uh, the killing uh, in a mob action form, which uh, is in Acts 7, verses 57 through 60. But uh, if we look at this, and, and we really need to uh, pull the blinders off and look at how this whole system works. But when we look at verse number 34, it says, there stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel, uh, Gimaliel, I'm sorry, Gimaliel. Uh, he was a doctor of the law. He was a Pharisee, and he had a reputation among all the people, and he commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, meaning he decided, uh, give them a little room. Uh, let's... Uh, Let's uh, 
extend, give them a little, give them a little leniency, give them some room. Uh, first of all, let's just see if they actually are a threat. Uh, he began to inform the council and he began to say to them to uh, ye men of Israel take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men halt wait a minute pause let's look at this situation he said before these days rose up Tutus boasting himself to be somebody this is verse number 36 to whom a number of men about 400 joined themselves and they were slain all of them as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to nothing and then he goes on to again to tell them about uh, Judas in verse 37 of Galilee and how he rose up in the days of taxing and he drew away many people with him and that they also perish. And uh, many of them were good disciples as well. They obeyed him, but they were dispersed. And although initially at the beginning, these things appeared as though they were going to be threats and that they were going to cause disruption, but they fizzled out. So before we get all hot and worked up and before we get all bothered about this, just uh, let them go and see what they do. This here will probably just fizzle out like those other incidents that we've uh, encountered in time. You know, there's always an unrest. There's always a group among the masses that rise up. You know, they can't take our oppression and our suppression anymore. And so you're always going to have these little outbursts here and there. But wait and see if it gathers any magnitude before we become all worked up and everything about how this should be addressed. And now I say it to you, verse 38, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Now, one of their concerns was is that they did not want to have the blood of Christ on their hands. They didn't want to be associated with that. But now he's instructing them and he's telling them that, you know, if this here is of man, if this is just something based around one personality or someone, you know, uh, let it go ahead. But if this is of God and we stand in the way, the people already believed that this was of God. They had already seen the presence of the Spirit of God. They had already seen the works. They already had recognized that what these men are teaching and saying has a different reaction when they speak compared to those who sit high and those rulers who lord over us. There's a difference in this delivery and the reaction when the people hear it and receive it, then what we're hearing coming out of the temples and the synagogues. And so therefore, what uh, the uh, spokesperson, Gimaliel, what he is saying to them is, we don't want to also be attached with Wait a minute, why are they against these people for the works that they're doing? So when we read further, it says, and in the 40th verse, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, 
They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. And there's something about after someone among the group advises them with wisdom and gives them a strategy, a scheme, this is how we're going to deal with this this time, the system still has to enforce its power. It still has to demonstrate that uh, you are at our disposal. Uh, we can do to you and with you as we choose. So in order to still put fear into them, they beat them and then they released the apostles. Now, the advisor of the group didn't mention anything about, okay, beat them first and then let them go. But he said just to let them go. They agreed with him, but they still had to leave their signature on the situation. And so uh, I think a good passage of scripture to look at in this case, because um, as we go further, we recognize that they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, what makes one, after we've already uh, suffered under the hand of oppression or suppression, uh, what makes one continue to go ahead and do that which they already know what the end results would be. What, what causes them to say, well, I think I could take another beating. Uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'll continue to do this. I would like to address our attention to Matthew, the 10th chapter. And I believe I'm going to start the reading. Yeah, I think I'm going to start the reading at Matthew 10 and 24. And maybe this will uh, shine some light on the subject. Now remember, this here is where Christ has chosen the uh, 12 apostles the disciples and he's giving them instructions and he is sending them out uh, and as they are being commissioned to go out and preach and to teach and to bring others and make others disciples here is what is spoken to them 24 the 21st verse says a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak it in the light. And whatever you hear in your ear, preach it on the housetops and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul but rather fear fear him and truthfully here this is not a fear of uh, being uh, afraid this is more of a reverence but reverence him who is able to destroy both the soul and body in hell. Now, as we listen to this, here is the 
instructions of the master to his disciples as he's commissioning them to go out and to preach and to teach the things that they have heard from his own lips and the things which they have seen in his own presence. And he's informing them to go out and then he he makes them realize that the disciple is not greater than the teacher and the servant is not greater than the master. And he allows them to recognize that on many occasions uh, where he was preaching and teaching that the crowds and again this same group, these religious rulers, Pharisees and chief priests and Sadducees that uh, they many times wanted to take his life, but they feared the crowd. And so Jesus causes his disciples to recognize that you remember how they wanted to attack me when I was just trying to awaken the people's minds, when I was just trying to heal them when I was just trying to deliver and to release the people. And you remember how those in high positions responded to me? Well then, expect the same to you. And remember also he was putting them into the mindset, preparing them mentally as well as spiritually for the journey that they were about to take. And he was letting them know that there are going to be those that are going to threaten to kill you. There's going to be those that are going to threaten to beat you, to harm you, but don't have a greater fear for them than you do for me. Don't fear man more than you do your creator. And this is why Peter made the response when they spoke to him saying, didn't we tell you to keep your mouth closed? Didn't we tell you, watch what you say, make sure you don't mention the name of Christ, Jesus Christ. Didn't we tell you? And then Peter responded and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so when we combine Matthew, the 10th chapter, and read down towards the 20th, actually from the beginning all the way through down to verse 28 is definitely good reading. But uh, it gives us a better perspective of the mindset that must have prevailed in Peter and the apostles, uh, they began to reflect back on what their master had taught them and how the people responded to Christ. And if God did not render his son, his only son, and he didn't release him from the persecution, and from the naysayers and from those that were in opposition to him, then what more than for me? What more than for us? But then the reward of it all is, is that they, Peter and the apostles, they counted it as a signature of worth they counted it as a victory because apparently we, Peter and the apostles, were not an army. They were not a, a military. They were not uh, a new uh, hidden or secret, uh, secret government that was trying to emerge and, and uproot and, and take over. But they were just preaching about 
being repentant. They were just uh, preaching about uh, accepting the Lord, uh, about new life, about a change, about deliverance from the sin-filled world and uh, the release from men lording over you. And so they were just preaching about salvation and and being saved and and being preserved and and being released and because of those things it was a threat to people in positions of power and so they counted it as a badge of honor that imagine me this little nobody because of the thing that I'm saying it has aggravated and gotten the attention of those who have deemed themselves to be in positions of power. We hope that this lesson has forwarded uh, through scripture information that we can use uh, and that it has put some things upon your mind to cause you as well to reflect upon what God's teaching really is about and then what we are as disciples of Christ, uh, followers of Christ, trying to live and be Christ-like, what is required of us to whom much is given, much is required or expected. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.